Hi, good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. I am Emily Arson, a senior health policy analyst in the UHF Medicaid Institute, and I have the pleasure of introducing our morning panel, uh, Improving Medicaid Through Regional Health Planning. Um, the session will be moderated by Wade Norwood, CEO of Common Ground Health in the Finger Lakes region. Wade has spent his entire career serving communities and strengthening local partnerships to address health and social needs. For, for more information about Wade and all of our panelists, please refer to his bio on our conference website. And I will let Wade provide more information about the panel and introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, all. I am absolutely delighted to be here and to share uh, the thinking of my incredibly brilliant dear friends who will make up our panel today. Uh, before I begin, let me just congratulate and thank Dr. Uh, Xi and the United Hospital Fund staff uh, for a return to in-person gathering an opportunity I have been longing for to get back down to New York City. Uh, but I will say it's a bit of a challenge. I am incredibly skilled at having a necktie on in my Zoom space, uh, but I generally have been doing this for the last two and a half years without having to wear shoes or socks. So if you see me getting a bit nervous, it's because my shoe uh, control is going to be uh, unraveling. Um, I'd also love to thank Amir for what was an incredible keynote address. Uh, he delivered on the promise of my being able to learn new things. There were breaking news elements. And again, I salute this conference. It is why it is a landmark, because it is a great way in which we as a community are uh, aiming to uplift not only our own communities, but the statewide community. This is a great way in which we can share and gain knowledge and deepen our relationship to each other. Uh, my, the aim of my remarks are to just simply provide some introductory and framing comments for what I hope will not be a panel discussion, but I hope will be a dialogue. Uh, among myself and my colleagues and that you will join in uh, because we are about to do something that we have never done before. And we're going to need our collective wisdom in order to be successful and not any solo superstars. Uh, I'll introduce Common Ground Health as the regional health planning entity for the nine county Finger Lakes uh, uh, region of upstate New York. Uh, and one of my most vociferous comments is the waiver redefines what that region is, at least in our view, and we want to be able to define ourselves and name ourselves, and I am hopeful that the state's policy framework will continue to allow that to happen. Uh, but we uh, see it as our mission to bring focus to the region's health issues through our research data analytic, through our community engagement, and through the incredible community partnerships in which we engage. And each of our panelists represents several of those different collaborative partnerships. And we believe that partnership is going to be essential to fulfilling not just the letter, but the spirit of the waiver. Um, and, and I absolutely say to you that without a doubt, I think that we are well positioned because we are a mismatch team of uh, uh, folks put together because we've actually gone through previous battles together. And it is our time together in the foxhole that really has given us the opportunity to learn how to not just partner with each other, but how to disagree and argue with each other. And I think that that is an essential characteristic of our community that I think is going to be indispensable to doing the job of the waiver because putting together this panel was not just thinking of impressive organizations and fancy titles that look good because that's not the way to do this stuff. This stuff is really rooted in shared vision 
shared experience and a shared commitment to working our way through the tough moments to get to the more wonderful moments. Um, I came to health planning in 2006 after 20 years of experience in state government. Uh, 16 of those years I served on the local Rochester City Council and I left elective politics said to my very dear friend Val Gray, uh, with whom I grew up in the New York State Assembly when she was very young. Um, back, I, I walked away from elective politics saying that there had to be a place and space where difficult issues could be discussed in a fact-based manner and the conversation when difficult could be supported because it's data informed. And it struck me as I thought, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? How much that could be the healthcare sector's com contribution to the rest of the community. The fact that in the world of healthcare, data is so very important. And the other reason I came here is because as this waiver proves, Willie Sutton was right. When they asked him, Willie, why'd you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. This is an incredible opportunity lined up, as Amir suggested, with ARPA and the other federal government responses to really have the resources on hand to really effectuate transformation. And that is without a doubt by focusing on health equity, by saying non-clinical solutions are essential to clinical outcomes improvement, by making those things central to state policy, that is freaking revolutionary. It is exactly why I came into this work and why I remain in this work every day. And my hope and aim is that we will leave out of here not saying a great time was had by all, but we will leave out of here saying that the commitment to effectuating this and leading the transformation beyond the waiver is not just something that's in Wade Norwood's head. It's something that we're doing as a statewide community of partners. So thank you very much for your attention. I will now turn over and introduce my friends. Uh, our panel uh, uh, guest is made up by, here in person, Carol Tagus, uh, who is the executive director of our Finger Lakes PPS. I met Carol long ago when I first came into the world of healthcare, really still trying to figure out something more than the fellow Lord Conesford described who read that smoking was bad for him, so he quit reading. Um, that was about my knowledge of healthcare, and Carol has been an incredible friend since those early days of really helping uh, the understanding and the mastery of being the wife of a restaurateur, she knows my business, and helping me in my language learn and grow in this world of healthcare. Uh, Laura Gustin, who is the executive director of our Systems Integration Project, now named Together Now. Uh, Laura, uh, uh, quite honestly, stretches back to those first days when I was trying to figure everything out because Laura was a, brand, uh, a graduate student intern and then later the newer member of the Finger Lake Health Systems Agency as it was at that time. And uh, I, I remember saying to Laura, I never heard of a logic model. <laughs> That's not how we pass legislation. And so Laura's pain, I'm certain it was painstaking for her, uh, but her careful uh, uh, attempts to help me learn the world of project planning and project management um, has remained unparalleled that she has been an expert leader in our community's effort of really trying to bring together and uh, support our not-for-profit community-based organizations. And since I talk about not-for-profit community-based organizations, joining us by the magic of Zoom is Anne-Marie Cook, who is president and CEO of Lifespan, uh, which is our uh, preeminent 
uh, older adult serving uh, organization in town. Uh, what Anne Marie does and her staff does is just absolutely phenomenal. But in addition to that role, Anne Marie also serves as the volunteer uh, president of the board of our local health information exchange, our Rio. Uh, and so Anne Marie comes to this conversation knowing not just the world of service delivery, but because of the fact that her organization has to relate so tightly with uh, nursing homes and other organizations serving older adults, she absolutely knows the information, uh, the value of information and information exchange. So with that as introduction, I'm gonna ask my friends if they would further introduce themselves and in the order in which I called upon them, ask them if they would introduce themselves by responding to two questions when it comes to health planning and to the work of the waiver preparation, if you could share your role, your organization's role, and why health planning brings value to what it is that you all do. Am I starting? Yes, you okay, are, Carol. Great, great. Thanks, Wade, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. So thank you so much for um, inviting me to the panel. <laughs> uh, and uh, having dinner last night for four hours, I think it was, um, <laughs> like we normally do. Uh, it's a wonder we ever get any work done, right? Um, so what's really important about um, the work that we do in regional planning, um, especially as it relates to Finger Lakes PPS. As you know, all of you were involved in the district program initially, and as Amir uh, spoke of, the district work really laid a foundation for our future work. And this is really community planning at the highest level for healthcare and transforming healthcare. Um, in the district program, um, we are one of a few uh, PPSs that uh, still are around, and we know that there are our friend uh, legacy PPSs that are also out there. And we did a lot of great work under DISRIP. Uh, we did projects, we did community needs assessment uh, that actually was done in tandem with Common Ground Health, back then the Finger Lake System Health Systems Agency, who did the community needs assessment for us. Um, another little tidbit of information is that Laura Gustin herself was um, one of the primary authors of the uh, district application in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, and Anne-Marie Cook is one of our main uh, CBO partners in our region. So all of these things put together really laid the groundwork for a successful uh, district program. However, we do know that a lot of the project work really focused on the hospitals, on the emergency room, ED care triage and care transitions and all of those things. But really the most exciting work I have to say really focused on what the work of the waiver is going to focus on and that is the social determinants of health and connecting clinical care and community-based care. And as part of our regional planning focus, it's really working with the community-based organizations and the clinical providers and the behavioral health providers and all of the agencies like ours that support those partners. We all have the same partners. We all sit at the same tables. The key is to align all of that in order to have a greater impact in the community. So in our post disrupt land, we take all of the work that we did, for example, in maternal child health, in behavioral health, and in social determinants of health, and we take it to the next level. And we focus and uh, really key in on ultimately what is going to be called for in the waiver, proving out that addressing social determinants of health impact clinical outcomes. So the only way that happens is with the collective of the agencies that support the partners, with strong community-based organization partners like Lifespan, and with uh, great collaboration across the clinical providers. Thank you. Laura? Sure. Um, so as, as Carol noted, um, I did spend a little time. A little our, time, maybe, our, maybe over <laughs> Christmas and Thanksgiving. And <laughs> um, And one of the reasons I left um, having a hard conversation with Carol and saying um, the value-based payment is going to come and our community-based providers are not ready. And so I moved over to United Way and in that role as Director of Strategic Initiatives really had the opportunity to say what would it take to get our community ready for a future state. Um, as, as part of that process, 
um, really also found that DSERP wasn't the only project in town. And frankly, our community was under a concurrent process um, to actually try and reduce poverty by 50% um, over 15 years. And at that moment in time, we had both the PPS and our anti-poverty initiative seeking to create a redesigned system that changed outcome for our most vulnerable community members. And that's really how the Monroe County Systems Integration Project was born. The Systems Integration Project is a multi-sector provider network. Um, it includes health, human service, education, public sector, and philanthropic partners. We've had about 300 partners who have spent over 12,000 collective hours over the last five years um, designing um, and now implementing a redesigned service delivery system and really using human-centered design as the cornerstone of how we do that work as well as creating a data ecosystem that supports those cross-sector interactions. I am also fortunate enough to have Wade Norwood as my co-chair um, for my work, and so, which I think really reflects why the importance of alignment between a coordinated integrated system of service delivery and a regional health planning organization. Um, for us, alignment is so important. Our work is very wide across community. Um, it's, I would say it's not an inch deep, I would say it's probably a mile deep. Um, <laughs> a mile wide, a mile deep, but what, we, what re regional health planning organization can do is go 20 miles deep. Wade and Carol, I'll just give one example, are both really looking at nursing homes and how to move people into um, nursing home facilities. I don't, I don't wanna focus on that. <laughs> you know, I'm really focused on cross-sector workflows, cross-sector relationships, and so it's really important to understand uh, what are the priorities of the healthcare sector. Um, healthcare sector is a both a provider and a consumer of an integrated system, and so making sure we're really strategically aligned is important, and having a regional health planning organization to facilitate that alignment is really necessary versus really having one-off conversations with every healthcare provider in town and trying to build consensus. Laura, thank way. you. The AAA, and to take your point and extend it, I'd say that as the son of an 82, three-year-old mom, um, my real focus is can we keep her out of the nursing right. home? <laughs> yeah. And that real force and voice around prevention and family systems is the final guest on uh, that we have with us. Anne-Marie, we're going to turn over to you for purposes of the same introduction by the same question. Thanks a million, Wade and Carol, and, and Laura, I wish I could be there with you, but I want to <laughs> thank you. As Wade said earlier, I'm the president and CEO of Lifespan of Greater Rochester, and we're a community-based aging service provider, human service provider, and we help older adults and family caregivers in a variety of ways. But I'll focus our work, really, we help people navigate both the human service system, social service system, and health care. And our role, really, is to address those social determinants of health. Um, and not only measure them, but ensure that we're uh, providing and maintaining someone's quality of life at home. But then my role, really, is taking that data back to that table that Wade really runs for our community and show people that the social determinants of health matter, that when we work together and integrate those social services and health care, we can get better results. And that health is not just health care, it's also what happens in the community. I also say, and you know, Wade talked about, I wear a couple different hats, chair of the Rio right now, which has become incredibly important, but also I'm fortunate enough to serve on one of Wade's committee, a metrics advisory committee, under the offices of, auspices of Wade and Common Ground Health. And it's really the committee right now determining population health measures and data we want to look at. And really, I have to say I'm committed, not only in this work, but also the work Laura's doing and the work Carol's doing, because we can see improvement in people's lives. And that's what matters right now. And so we're coming together as a community to say, how do we do this better? How do we use data to change things? And I think all of us on the panel is committed to that. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you all, because I think that it is this model of how community effort comes together 
to support direction setting and accountability is really what the waiver is evoking in this concept of the hero. Um, and Lord, one of the comments that you had made earlier about we had our anti-poverty initiative, which is a state-funded ASPRI uh, initiative, and please don't ask me to remember what ASPRI <laughs> stands for, State Poverty Initiative, I think, Empire State Poverty uh, Reduction, Reduction Initiative, ASPRI. Um, but it really points out how in all of our communities we have a variety of different initiatives, all of which are very strong, but not necessarily working together. And the state is incredibly proficient at creating uh, new acronyms for new programs, and we swim in an alphabet soup. So, Lord, my question uh, to you is, how do you, trying to bring these things together, how do you build and promote trust? And how do you build and promote inclusion so that we don't just have the voice of consumer representatives, but we actually have the voice of representative consumers? Yeah, so really great question. I think first, in terms of building trust um, in a in a collective that certainly extends across sectors where you have individuals who have the same, same position in very different organizations. And while they might see each other as, at galas, never really interact professionally. Um, how do you get them to come to common, common vision and understanding? I think first you have to set the table. Um, you know, we spent the first six months of our work uh, setting our collective vis vi vision mapping the system to show that we truly were an interconnected service delivery system and so everyone could see themselves within it. Um, we created a theory of change. Every CEO at the table did a lot of group work. Um, I think part of that process is a lot of active listening. I've told every provider and uh, person in our collective, my job is to deliver wins, right? I can't deliver 100% of the wins that you need, but I can try to get to 60%. And if we can get that across the board, um, we can really have a productive consensus building process um, that allows us to, I think, have a good common vision that's reachable. Another thing that was really important which is gonna be hard with the waiver, but maybe if you start now, is we didn't put governance in place for almost a year. So before we have started having conversations about power structure and decision making, we really started with vision. Um, another thing that was really important is that we centered equity and person-centeredness. And for us, both of those words are verbs. And so what does it truly mean to be equitable? What does it truly mean to be person-centered? Uh, we've trained 400 uh, practitioners in human-centered design across the sectors that we work in. We've brought um, community members into our design thinking process. Um, co community members, impacted community members are working a lot alongside providers to redesign a reimagined system. By doing that, it diffuses some of the politics and competition because the community member is sitting at the table telling you how they need the system to work for them. Um, and then I don't care who wins the competition because it's focused on the right thing, which is delivering the result for the community member. Um, I think for us, another thing that was just really important is that we, because we extend across sectors, we were able to focus on public good versus the good of any individual sector. And so by centering the person, by focusing on public good, by talking about our data as community owned, um, by talking about the movement of data um, as a public utility that has really allowed us to collaborate in a really different way. Thank you, Laura. I, I really, as you know, hammer repeatedly form follows function and how important it is to have a sense of a shared problem statement and a shared theory of action to really be able to reach to a shared function. Um, Carol, clearly in retrospect, the 
real world experience of district was that the function was that matrix of outcomes. Right. And we were not as a community in the state of readiness when DISRUP arrived as we are now. The good thing in our community is we did decide one PPS, that we did not want to have dueling approaches to transformation. As you think about readiness, what would be the things, to Laura's point, um, if you're not, I'd be doing it now, not <laughs> waiting until September or January. What, what would be the things you'd be advising people from the position of having gone through the disrupt experience to make the experience of the waiver that which we aim? So I think, uh, so having the seven years of experience now, um, hurting the cats, I think they're cats. Um, and our PPS, uh, and there are a couple across the state, uh, brought together competing health systems, uh, competing uh, clinical FQHCs, competing community-based organizations. But the key was to have the common goal to be successful in the projects, and then ultimately to be successful in clinical outcomes. So since our PPS was so large, 10,000 square miles, over 300,000 lives, Laura in her <laughs> design of, uh, or her brainchild kind of uh, in partnership with other people in our community, in the design of our application said, you know what, we have got a large community, we need to break this up a little bit. But not break it up by health systems and FQHCs and CBOs, but rather break it up by naturally occurring care networks. And the naturally occurring care networks, and we ended up with five, we're consolidating them to four now, always was led by a health system and a, a community-based provider. It was made up of the providers in that community, healthcare, behavioral health, and non-clinical, who naturally work to get together. Maybe not as efficiently as we want them to under the new waiver, under the systems integration project, under you know the last couple of years of DISRIP, but really moving toward what are, the, what are those naturally uh, natural referral uh, patterns. In that process, we determined, we found out that people, people did not know each other very much. And over the course of the seven years, they got to know each other. Over the course of the seven years, they had shared projects. They had shared goals. And then ultimately, over the last couple of years of DISRIP, we determined, as many people across the state determined who were working on DISRIP, there was not an exact direct line from the project work to the clinical outcome work. It was going to take a lot longer, and it was going to take a lot more alignment of incentives and focused work. And so then we transitioned to focusing on clinical outcomes. And at that point, by that time, we have more mature IPAs that are networks. We have a new FQHC IPA, Finger Lakes IPA. Shout out to Mary Zelazny leading that effort. And we have behavioral health care collaboratives that have been funded by New York State. We had four in our region. And we have two very strong health homes. Um, and so at that point, we said, you know what? The clinical outcome improvement is not going to just happen by a hospital-based IPA, a clinical-based IPA. We really needed to bring everybody together and we sprinted and we jogged. We literally called these programs the sprint and then the jog because we were under the gun in getting some of these clinical outcome, uh, outcomes uh, achieved. And in order to do that, we identified IPAs, the BHCCs, the health homes. And we pulled them all together and we said, you know what, we have this huge list of clinical outcomes, but let's just focus on the ones that we think are achievable, narrow it down to 10 or 12, and guess what? Put some dollars behind it, incentive dollars. Oh, by the way, it's kind of like training wheels for VBP. And then everybody goes after those measures collectively. You have these many patients that have gaps in care. You have this many patients. You have this many patients. We used our data to show them what their numbers looked like. And then they all went at it, went collectively, the BHCCs, the, home, the health homes and the IPAs, working to address social determinants of health that were barriers to closing gaps in care. And guess what? It took a very short period of time, but it was an intense work with incentive dollars, VBP training wheels, and we achieved clinical outcomes in the end. So that is an example of what we try to do to get the community ready for VBP. 
all of the work that Laura's doing with systems integration, uh, making the community accountable for outcomes in health and equity and education and social services, that all wraps up together and bolsters how we get to health equity. All the work that Lifespan does with their Community Care Connects program, I think that's the right <laughs> title, that we've been working with uh, Anne Marie on for a long time. She has proof and evidence now that all of that care navigation that happens improves clinical outcomes. That is VBP training. And that's how we're going to get ready as a community. I, I, I exercise the prerogative of being Reverend Norwood and go back to a statement that you made of forming these structures and approaches around these naturally occurring care networks and relationships and discovering even though these were a set of dedicated really motivated people who worked well, they really didn't know each other. Right. The uh, understanding of how the meeting space has to go beyond talking at each other or delivering speeches to each other to really understanding who we are as human beings. Um, in my faith tradition, it's testimonial service, that people have space and opportunity to say, this is what I'm going through, this is what's challenging me, or oh, here's an incredible victory I just accomplished. I just want to put a stake in the ground for the rest of our conversation of how that is an essential ingredient to being successful that without that, you don't get transformation. With that, you actually get equity because we all begin to understand how we are all privileged and how we are all challenged and we stand in need of each other's help. So let me ask you, Carol, since you're center stage and Anne-Marie, you're gonna get the follow-up to this one. Notwithstanding our desire to try and achieve these very broad rules, one of the ways in which you and uh, uh, members of my team are valuable is understanding there are still rules. And Medicaid rules are the most difficult of all rules. Uh, and on this journey we've been on, policy decisions have been reversed. They've been changed. Uh, some of the things we were hoping for from the federal level have yet to appear. Um, how do you, Carol, lead a team, internal and external, and keep them motivated in the context of rulemaking coming from elsewhere? Right. So one of the things that we always say, and I think other PPSs had said this, is we were building the, the plane while we were flying it. And all through that process, the rules kept changing like every day. And we would call our friend PPSs and say, what is your interpretation of this change? What is your, and sometimes you didn't want to ask the question. You kind of had to go with what you thought it was and really not ask uh, because you were afraid of what the answer was going to be. But the key was to really focus on the end goal, just recognizing that the changes were going to happen no matter what. Document the changes, understand what the impact to the partners were, have the partners tell you their story this is what happens in our office when that primary care and behavioral health co-location can happen. This is the impact to the patient, the story of the patient that has to go into this door or that door and then leave the office and then come back in the other door. I mean, that's just ridiculous. So you have to listen to the partner. They're the ones that are doing the work on the ground. We don't do the work on the ground. Anne-Marie's <laughs> organization does the work on the ground. We are facilitators for them to do the work, the best work that they can. So our job is to listen to what those barriers are and to join forces in advocacy. We're not a lobby firm. We're not an advocacy firm. However, Common Ground Health is. However, the children's agenda is. So we go to our partners in our community who know us well, and we say, this is what's going on with our partners. And 
What can you do about it? What letter do I have to sign? What button do I need to push? Who do I need to talk to at DOH? How can we get this changed? There is some flexibility, obviously, during the waiver, where you have waivers within the waivers, and you have to apply and all of that, and we're hoping we're going to see that again. The key is, what do you have to do to keep that waiver going and turn it into not a waiver, but actual policy? Excellent, excellent response, and it stages up well. Anne-Marie, uh, I have a very clear memory of the 13th of March, 2020, <laughs> meeting at the United Way at Laura's uh, command, and we were all sitting and working away on how we integrate through systems integration, and you walked in late, and you walked in late looking like I have never seen you look before, and you and I have known each other since 1985, um, and you shared with us in those first 48 hours of the public health emergency what the impact was on real families. Um, so I, I, I invite you to just share thoughts with regard to Carol being bright enough to say how I do it is one thing. How does that fidelity to mission in the face of changing rules and resources, play itself out at the level of direct care to families? And what should we be keeping in mind, Anne-Marie, from the perspective of a CBO? Thank you, Anne-Marie. And so if I were to put another flag in the ground, I would say that I believe we operate in the model of the symphonic orchestra, <laughs> that we can't get by with everybody playing the guitar because we need more instruments in the string section and we need more sections than just the string section. And in the symphonic movement, every section, every orchestra has their part, but everybody's part has to come together in order to make the symphonic movement occur. I do believe that data is the score for that symphony. So Anne-Marie, in your world, dealing with your population, what data do you collect? How do you use that data? What data are you missing? And as you think of interoperability, 
to be successful in the waiver, this is your Rio hat on, what do we need? Yeah, thank you, Wade. I really would like to make five points, and, and in particular talk to my nonprofit community-based service providers, because I think this is where we make it or break it in the waiver. Um, for lifespan, and really aging service providers across the state, we do have an electronic record for social services now. It's called Peer Place. We collect a minimum data set, collect our case notes in there. We have a closed loop system for aging service providers that we can look at. And it's really the basis, I think, of what we need to work in this system. A lot of it, I have to say, enhanced because of the work that Carol helped us with through DISRIP and the PPS here. Uh, but several years ago, we did connect to the Rio. So as a human service, community-based service provider, we knew as older adults, healthcare mattered. And when an older adult hits the emergency room or the hospital, in decades past, we didn't know about it, even if we were working with the older adult. And so we connected our information to the Rio so to get these critical alerts so when one of our clients hits one of the hospitals here, we know immediately and we can contact the discharge planner not to do their work, but to work in conjunction with them to address some of those difficult transitions of care that occur and we can begin that you know, connection between healthcare and community-based services. So that's my second point of I think how critical that data and information is to us. Third point, Wade, I want to say is years ago, we made the decision that we had to evaluate data better, and through our friends at the New York Academy of Medicine as our <laughs> evaluator, we began looking at data. And I can give you pages of information <laughs> <laughs> on which social determinants of health make a difference in health care yeah. utilization and decreasing ED hospitalization and observation. And they have helped us do that especially for community-based service organizations. It is hard to get that kind of evaluation data, but I think critical as we play such an important role in the future. I would say the fourth point is we have to measure and analyze. We have additional people here analyzing data for us so that we can tweak programs to have better results. And finally, I know even through all of that, it's not enough. And that's why, honestly, I'm tied to the hip with Laura Dustin and... Um, <laughs> in her work, because even though we have made great strides in integrating with healthcare, that is not enough. And Laura's work through systems integration. So the most important thing, so we can serve people better. And um, I know earlier the Medicaid director said, let's try to make it simple with this kind of, I think at the forefront, using that his principle, keep it simple to make sure that we can get people connected to services they need so they can live better and improved lives. And I think each one of us plays an important role in that. But for community-based services, I'm going to say I'm worried in the waiver that we don't have enough support to provide that key data uh, and evaluation that, honestly, we've never been funded for before that we will need in this waiver so we can play the right role as we help people Anne Marie, that was an incredibly great response. And as I listened to you, it made it very clear to me that I need to say in public space, we are not a paradise where all of this stuff <laughs> just happens because I'm melodious and, and everybody else is just so smart and talented. Um, we have lots of problems every single day on the journey that we have established to take. And in the course of the last five weeks, uh, you and Carol were absolutely instrumental in helping work through a challenge. And I believe we made it through that challenge because of the incredible trust and regard that I have for the two of you all and the fact that you all just refuse to let me be idiotic. Um, <laughs> there, there, there is the need to say 
we don't yet, through our processes, extend that down to our neighbors in need. Um, and Laura, I'd be interested in your response to uh, 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 Anne Marie in terms of thinking about what does data mean to people? And what does it mean to, I just need to get my problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a compl it depends on the person. Um, I think that, I mean, it's even different for frontline, even within an organization that we work with, it's different. When we, the, one of the very first things we did in systems integration, we knew that we were going to create an integrated data ecosystem that extended across health, human service, and education. So there was a common 360 degree view that a pediatrician and a school social worker and a CBO could all see with consent. Um, and so that was the vision, but then like, what does that even mean? Like, that's a good vision, but how do you do it? So the first thing we did was do business requirement interviews across the community. We met with over a hundred people and said, what do you need this data system to do for you? And we found there was actually um, significant common ground. We actually <laughs> also found um, that, for example, the data that the pediatrician wanted lived um, oftentimes in the school district. And so how do you bring those um, pieces of information together. I also, though, during those business requirement interviews, met with CBOs who had over 20 data systems, who were all required to have those data systems by government programs, and who had never used those data systems to create business in intelligence to transform how they do business. And so, you know, even within, and now we're in the middle of implementation and early adoption, and I have frontline workers being like, what the heck are you talking about? Why do I need to do this? Like I am put, you know, implementing new data systems all the time. How is this different? Um, the, the other thing I will say that I think we really learned from people because we did human-centered design, we ran prototypes, uh, we found that people were not gonna be okay with just building another data system for providers. They want to be empowered and have the tools that work for them. And so what we've created in My Wayfinder, this, um, this tool that, that we've used to connect providers, um, it's also to be put in the hands of people so that people can um, see their 360 degree view, so they can self-refer into services. They don't want providers to refer them all over the place. It makes them feel commodified. They wanna, sell, they wanna select their program and provider. They wanna add a person to their care team. They wanna choose who's on their care team. That we, through human-centered design, um, we created an informed consent process that is called the journey of trust. We wanted to make sure per, per the people we were working with that a person could interact with this data system without ever having to create account, um, that you had to consent to create an account um, and share information, that you could turn privacy controls off by provider. So you could only share information with a provider when you needed to, um, not when the provider desired it. And so, you know, for each person, and I still have people even though we have an equity review board and every piece of, that we've constructed um, has been gone through an equity review process and we have strong diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies and include community every step of the way, I still have a lot of community members who will never use what we created because they won't trust. And I have to be okay with that too, um, which is why as we think about the tools that support integration, we've made, made sure that technology isn't the only front door. Um, we've created a process where a person can call 211, where they can click on My Wayfinder, or they can come into a neighborhood navigation center for help. And so um, data is important. The business intelligence the data can create is important. The measurement model that you can imagine and, and build out because you're generating new data is really exciting. But just also know that um, sharing data is a personal choice and, and protecting that data for public good is really important. Data sovereignty is really important. Um, and those are some of the most important commitments we've made to community in that so space. So we're, we're at the top of the home stretch and we're gonna finish my bloviating and then open <laughs> the floor to get questions <laughs> and comments from our friends. But, but Laura, let me, while I have you staying on that point, 
I'll stick a flag in the ground and say, I'm excited that our approach to the waiver and our responses to the waiver concept paper and the waiver draft application was really, wow, it's about time the state's listening to us. This is all the stuff we've been working on. And our aim is to just simply make sure that we're able to use the waiver as an opportunity to not quote unquote do what the state tells us to do, but to discover the opportunity of the state saying, keep doing more of that. Yeah. But as exciting as that is, I'll say in open space, your deathly fear is this can't be a healthcare thing. Yes. So what would you, what are the processes uh, 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 and the shared language protocols that you point to to give you assurance this town's not going to screw it up as rapidly as we tend to screw up most things? Um, I mean, it's been a long time coming. I think, as I noted in the beginning, um, by centering the voice of the consumer, as, as we just said, we've messed up. We don't, we're, not, we're imperfect as a community. We've had a lot of failed initiatives over time. We also have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the country. Uh, we've asked community in a totally different way to come along with us on this journey. Um, and the, I don't think the community would ever forgive us if we walked away, with, if we walked away from all they shared in pursuit of a Medicaid waiver. Right, we have to do both and. Uh, we have to create wins for the health sector. We have to create wins for the nonprofit sector. We have to use this set of, in, this infrastructure we've built under systems integration um, to, to help both sectors and the community achieve its goal. I also have an education sector who I'm very accountable to, um, who are using these same tools in their community school model to transform how they're serving neighborhoods. Um, and just getting into just quickly sort of things we've done to get to this point. I have a legal work group of 20 lawyers from across these sectors who have worked <laughs> together for three years to put together the legal framework for data sharing. Um, I have a shared accountability work group who's created a shared language protocol so that across health, human services, education, public sectors, we're defining what food crisis or stable housing means consistently. Um, we're developing a common set of service pathways. So no matter where a person enters the system, everyone knows exactly how providers are gonna interact to deliver an outcome. We have shared definitions for what outcomes um, mean for states of well-being. Um, we have a measurement model that everyone has agreed to that doesn't just include health outcomes, it includes a range of population level outcomes, um, which I will say, and I say this often, and I stole it from someone, but I'll say it here, because we have come to learn and agree and have consensus in our community that the social determinants of health are the same as the social determinants of education, and which are the same as the social determinants of economic mobility. And so once you agree that, and once you agree that you are an interconnected system and any movement you make in any piece of the system is going to have reactions in other pieces. When you've changed those mental models, um, then there's sort of no going back to say, we're now going to re-silo ourselves um, because there's a big pot of money in front of us. We're instead gonna leverage and braid that, that pot of dollars to help us achieve a broader community vision. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, Anne-Marie, I, I would say that I have been very much struck by the experience of supporting equitable COVID vaccine uptake. That the challenge was not limited to the inner city of Rochester or to poor black and Latinos. There was just as much a uh, challenge in suburban communities and an even greater challenge in rural communities. And I make that statement with incredible clarity that in our Finger Lakes region, 
there's almost an equal distribution of folks in poverty between the urban, the suburban, and the rural milieu. Um, I just offer the opportunity for you, Anne-Marie, for any comments or reflections on the needs for families to be supported that keeps our focus on this is beyond the ghetto. Yeah, absolutely, Wade. I mean, you pointed out such a good point. And, you know, during that COVID vaccine um, time in the beginning, so much of trying to get a vaccine was if you went online. And so what did we see that those individuals who didn't have computer access, whether they were urban, suburban, or rural, really suffered? I know earlier, one, uh, somebody asked the commissioner Medicaid a question, really a colleague of mine, I know an aging service social worker said, you know, access, digital access is important at that point. And it certainly was during the vaccines. We will continue to see a challenge for older adults, I think, to navigate systems as, as it becomes um, more online, more digital. So we will see those access issues and we need to address those access issues. Carol, final question. I'm sorry, I was gonna do my final question. You wanna take right, right now and go in? I'll do final question, and then I'm going to hand it over to Emily, who will then be our uh, 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 hostess through the rest of the <laughs> time together. Um, Carol, I was just going to ask, we're in this incredibly liminal space right now between what was disrupt and the waiver to come. And in this liminal space, there are very fascinating things that you're doing with the capacity of our PPS to support CBOs, uh, the doula collaborative being one. Right. Just wondering if you might want to just give examples of what are things that we are doing now with hospitals as partners that really help pave the way to where we're going. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope I'm not ringing because I don't think my phone no, is No, that was me. my phone okay, to tell me it was time sure. to stop. Emily, oh, and, and I had a great time actually, going. Actually, that's perfect timing. <laughs> that's perfect timing because... Wade's instrument in the symphony is a triangle. Amen. And we, and just so you know. Him one. We've gifted and him we one. gifted him one. So this chime here sounded like a triangle, so that was perfect. That's exactly that was perfect. Um, so I have to say, that in district work was really great. We did a lot of great work. We achieved you know, 99% of the milestones, clinical outcomes, et cetera. I have to say the most fascinating and interesting and rewarding work has been after DISRIP. And that is because we are focusing on community-based organizations. We refreshed our community needs assessment. We said, oh, guess what? Behavioral health, maternal child health, social determinants of health, and care management are still uh, in need of being addressed. So in the maternal child health space, we're partnering uh, with organizations, local organizations, on a doula program. We are partnering with our local food bank, Foodlink, on uh, food um, boxes for pregnant moms. Uh, we are partnering with uh, behavioral health uh, organizations on furthering primary care and behavioral health integration. Uh, we are partnering with Lifespan on enhancing and scaling their Community Connects program, really focusing on that community navigation. So we are now in the space of connecting community and clinical. But the twist is we are looking towards sustainability. So in all of our reviews of these 30 incredible large-scale programs that community-based organizations are working on, there is an evaluation component. There is a sustainability question. What is your plan for engaging with the managed care organizations so that you can prove to them that this work that you are doing is improving health outcomes? What does the VBP look like? And maybe the VBP is a baby step with a fee schedule. The waiver references the North Carolina model with fee schedule, this much for a box of food, this much for community navigation service, this much for housing navigation. I used that slide. I actually went to North Carolina and I compi compiled a little slide so that community-based organizations could see what this could actually look like. And then that ultimately would get embedded in a VBP pilot or whatever that the waiver is going to call for, and then ultimately be sustainable in true VBP after the waiver is done. 
So this is really exciting. This liminal space is finally getting to that bridge that is going to take us uh, to the other side. And with the managed care organizations at the table as part of the hero and being critical to the partnership, we are set. We have all the ingredients in place with all of our collective work over the last seven years, and especially with kind of the overall determinants of health um, that systems integration is working on. We are positioned to be successful and to really make an impact in our region. So my colleagues did a phenomenal job. I failed miserably, but we will now <laughs> yield the controls over to Emily. How did you incorporate the voices of smaller providers and smaller CBOs and balance that with larger providers and larger CBOs? Laura? Yeah, sure. So um, I think like size doesn't matter when you're trying to build consensus. And so we were really inclusive. Like I said, we went out, we gathered business requirements, both in service delivery model um, and in our data ecosystem um, from providers of all sizes. Uh, another really good thing that I think we did that a lot of small providers participated in is a round of prototyping. So we trained providers and community members in human-centered design. We asked them to do delivery system redesign prototypes. Um, we gave them some incentive dollars to do that. We took them through three iterations. And so those types of activities we had a we had a big um, poster. We had 29 sort of prototyping teams, a multiple provider. You know, it's you, you have to purposefully create the opportunity, I guess. And you have to, um, you have to, uh, for us, our model is a consensus model, even though it takes time, which requires you um, to hear and to take action on all the voices in the room to at least get to the point where everyone can say, I can live with it. And you have to understand the wins that you that small providers need generated for them, and you have to create a pathway to deliver those wins. Uh, thank you for the uh, terrific discussion, uh, Tim Johnson from the Greater New York Hospital Association. When you hear uh, Amir's discussion of the interest of the state in the development of the heroes, and you see what's in the way of our application, based on your experience uh, in the Finger Lakes region, Common Ground, certainly Wade, and the other organizations, are there any danger signs, red flags, anything that concerns you about where the state wants to go with the expectations of what the heroes would do for a particular region? Very interested. In I, I, I would say that I appreciate greatly uh, the state looking at our work as a way to inform what this should look like as a statewide endeavor. I am very much focused on everybody should stick to their knitting and do that thing which they do well. And that community change occurs best when it's happening in a collaborative effort instead of it happening by one entity seeking to impose. So I think that the fundamental thing is to interpret the role of the hero as this orchestra, not as one musician. And I seek to play no instrument, as Carol noted, other than the triangle. <laughs> Let me be the guy who walks out at the end and everybody laughs when it's all over with. The, the, the idea of one entity trying to control everything is a bad model. And so I'm hopeful that the final waiver will allow for distributive leadership to be more clearly seen in the hero model that it really is not common ground health alone, or UHF would have just invited me here. But what they understood, it's common ground health with key partners who work strategically to involve the whole community. And I think, Tim, that's my major concern. If there's any leave behind, it would be please see yourselves as part of the waiver, and please see yourselves as part of your community's hero, and please make sure that the conversation around the hero is infused by we and not by me. Uh, hi. So you're talking about like 
the central authority is like it should be more distributed and data interportability. So uh, being a guy from the tech space and there is a new um, works on blockchain and other distributed technologies on how they could help he healthcare and how they could be used for integrating and it's like as you are saying that there should be a common consensus on moving forward with what the data usage is or how it is being worked upon. So like what do you think would be the problems of integrating that kind of a new technology or what is the problem of doing certain things in, in uh, like an economy like this right now? So what do you think? I mean, so I can start. I mean, I think um, part of our approach from the beginning has, like our providers were not interested in just building another data system. Like integration had to be part of our solution. Um, I think one of the things that we found early on on our integration journey um, is not every for-profit um, solution wants to integrate with a community solution. Amen. Um, and so that's a real challenge that we continue to work through. Um, I think having, we have strong, san having person-centered standards, not provider-centered standards around c informed consent and data sovereignty are big challenges. Um, there are lines in the sand that we're unwilling to cross. Um, and even in some cases, I'll just use the Rio, and it's not the wrong way, but how they obtain consent, opt-in versus opt-out, like they're just different standards than what the most vulnerable in our community requested out of our community information exchange. And so how do we, you know, how do we use this as a point of innovation to think differently? Um, technology is different than it was even five years ago. How do we leverage new technological solutions as we think about the preservation of debtor sovereignty, personal ownership of data while concurrently creating solutions where we're sharing information and how do we leverage the waiver to build those solutions in the communities and come together and share that information? I mean, for me, those are just some of the early learnings that we've we've had um, and I'm sure there will be more since we just started early adoption <laughs> in March so if you ask me in six months my list will probably be significantly longer <laughs> as will our understanding of the needs of CBOs across the size range we're gonna learn more as well the one thing I think is an opportunity and I've said that to even some folks in the room a lot of the data that we aim to integrate is owned by New York State it might not be owned by New York State Department of Health, but it's owned by New York State. So I think there's real opportunity for New York State to explore integrating its own data sets. Um, there's opportunity to leverage the shiny infrastructure in doing that. Uh, Amory talked about Peer Place. That's a New York State data set owned by New York State Office of the Aging. Um, you know, I can I do the long and expensive work to integrate New York State data sets locally, yes, but I would much rather that happen at the state level and I have one plug-in point. Um, so where can we also create some economies of scale, I think is an important question to consider. That, Anne-Marie, did you wanna chime in on that one? started systems integration, you know, and Laura talked about different systems, the first thing I said is, we're not giving up ours. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we've spent years putting data in there. We use the data. We actually use the data. So we're not giving up ours, Laura, so how do we integrate? And uh, I'm sure she heard that from others, too. Yeah. How do we integrate and have the power of systems integration without putting me through hell, quite frankly, trying to figure that out, and she did it. And that's an example of the hard conversations that we have in our community. You have to be <laughs> able to trust each other so you can say that. Um, and, and that's the beauty of um, the trust building and the collaboration that we have. Yeah, it's not, it, we have a great time together, we trust each other, we get a lot of things done, especially during COVID, we were meeting every single week. Laura brought us together every oh my single God, week. At the beginning, it was every single week. Actually, they started it was every day. <laughs> You're right, we it was every Sunday day. Sunday calls. Right, it was every day, then it was every three days, and then it was every week. I mean, it, there were 60 people uh, on this call that 
uh, county health department and the providers and the community-based organizations, one goal, get through this, get through this. And that was uh, an example of the regional collaboration um, that really takes us to the next level and prepares us for the waiver. I am going to end us before I'm told to end us <laughs> and <laughs> so simply say, say thank you to you all. Thank you to these incredible colleagues who came together to help us in this conversation. It is not lost on me that in Paris a hundred years ago, W.E.B. Du Bois was having this very same conversation, creating for the first time graphic displays of health data by race and making the argument in his book, The Philadelphia Negro, that if we want to improve the health conditions of those who are the least among us, let's pay attention to the water they drink, the air they breathe, and the food that they eat. It is sad that we are still having that conversation but it is incredibly exciting that we are still having that conversation. And I am very grateful that the United Hospital Fund continues to be a leading voice in that conversation. Thank you all very much.